did you say hydrate two ways? You said hydrate through the skin. Yeah. And then also at the sinuses. What does that mean? So, dude, check this out, right? If you're taking a shower, right? A lot of people think hydration is only like, oh, I, I'm drinking water, right? But the body can take in water, H2O, a bunch of different ways, right? You can, you can absorb, you will clearly absorb it through your skin, right? Mm. So as you're taking a hot shower, you are sweating out some toxins, but you're also able to absorb water through the skin as well because there's that dilation. And chlorine and all the shit. If you don't have a depending filter on. Depending on the filter, yeah. Yeah, depending on the filter. Um, but also, too, the sinuses do better in a more humid environment. Mm. So when the sinuses are too dry, you're going to see, sin like, you know, here in SoCal, especially when, like, there's high particulate matter from all of the pollution and shit like that. And lately, especially with all the fires. Yeah. People's respiratory systems have been suffering. So a lot of people with suffering with post-nasal drip. What's going on? Okay, the, the the sinuses will try and manufacture moisture because there's inadequate moisture in the air. So in order for the sinuses not to be cracked and dry and bleeding and, and you know, on the inside, they emit some mucus. The thing is that if that mucus doesn't get expressed forward, meaning like you don't shoot the snot rocket out the front, it's going to drip in the back of your throat. And then because it's so little at a time, it ends up just, especially as we sleep, draining backward down our throat so then we get upper respiratory irritation mm. that's important yeah so for me like one of my best tips as far as for my patients and for my athletes is like when you wash your hands whenever you can every time you wash your hands take some of that water and like wash your face but also blow your nose like with like a, almost like a handful of water and you know get some of that passive hydration in the sinuses like through the nose what do you think about uh, vaporizers and diffusers and essential oils and all that stuff um i think they're great i really do uh vaporizers i don't like as far as non like if something other than like a like a humidifier yeah that's what i meant i actually vaporizer might not be the right term yeah, yeah vap humidifier yeah vaporizers as far as like let's say if you know I'm, I'm trying to smoke a substance then then i don't really have a whole lot of experience with that so yeah. i can't really comment yeah no i meant, I meant humidifier but humidifier is for sure a great idea mm. um as far as your overall health yes for sure i i you know especially when we're in, in more arid climates like in socal and, like, the way this last summer was where it was just hotter than sin, I mean, shit. Like, it, it, again, when you think about the respiratory system as doing better with a certain level of humidity, why not? Why not tip the scale in, 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 in terms of your health that way? How does that trickle down into the rest of the system? So we're speaking about the respiratory system. How does that trickle into, say, the nervous system or, say, the musculoskeletal system? I mean, they're all the oh, same dude, system. There dude. is no separation. <laughs> but since we said respiratory system. Right. So think about this. One of the quickest ways of changing your body chemistry is to mess with your breath, your breathing cycles, right? So you want to change your blood pH? Real simple. Either hyperventilate or hold your breath. Mm. Instantly, your, your blood pH starts to change. So... If your breathing's not optimal, or you're struggling to breathe, or your breathing is somehow uncomfortable, whether it be through sinus congestion, whether it be through allergies, whether it be through like an upper respiratory irritation, fill in the blank with whatever the hell you want. There's going to be a stress on the system. It's like weight. You know what I'm saying? Like if you're trying to walk down the road, but you've got like a prowler, you know, like a, a weighted sled you know, around your neck and you're not really cognizant of it, you're like, Jesus, this is really hard. And then all of a sudden, like someone takes some weight off that sled. You're like, oh, not so bad. And then someone unhooks you from the sled and you're like, I never knew it could be this easy. Yeah, Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Especially if you've been for years walking around with that weighted sled tied to your neck. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So how does the, how does the respiratory system per se affect all these other systems? it's it's totally a domino effect like anytime you mess with someone's breath you impair someone's breath you de-optimize someone's breath there will be a trickle down effect a negative trickle down effect throughout the rest of the body mm. starting i think most fundamentally on the chemical level mm -hmm. before we were talking about uh, the video doing a hand-to-hand -hand, holding a girl up in a handstand all that and you could see once 
she gets slightly out of that that midline is the language that we were using like that that center point right what did you call that that kind of training was it aer aerobatics so acro acro yeah so partner acrobatics mm -hmm. yeah so it's people can see on my instagram slash other people's instagrams obviously it's uh just essentially holding in this specific instance i'm holding up this girl called eric uh eric calisthenics on instagram mm -hmm. And uh, holding her up in a handstand, and she's doing this like wavy leg business with it. Right. And you can feel, and you can see in my face, all of a sudden you're like, oh, Aaron's like struggling there at the end because she just goes off that midline slightly. Mm -hmm. You know, like literally, if you had measured, it's maybe she's off by a quarter inch. I put her off. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden, oh, all my muscles have to get jacked, and I have to really work to get her back in line. Right. When she's waving her legs like that, it just looks like you're, you're basically stabilizing a human slosh pipe <laughs> yeah. you know it looked it, i mean dude when i saw it, the average person is going to look at that and go like she's not moving a lot why is it so hard but right. like it's just because uh, she's able to stabilize like that because you're putting forth the effort to create a stable enough base but dude i mean like the the effort that you were putting out was not lost on me it's like as soon as i saw that i was like oh shit but so but that effort is a lack of my own skill you know, and that's the, and I think that that's the same thing that we do on a day to day life, on approach to business, approach to relationships, approach to our movement. That effort that we have to put out is is it's a manifestation of us just not working with technique enough. And it's it's interesting when you see like little things like that, where it's like, oh, your respiratory system's all dried out. You're having to work so much harder <laughs> than if you would just get a you know get a, a humidifier right. or something. You know, is is there? I wonder. Are there other things that stand out with you with working with patients that it's like, oh my God, you're carrying the sled around with you all the time. I'm sure there's probably a lot, but are there any kind of metaphoric sleds that people are just like, I had no idea. Um, like simple lifestyle hacks. And yeah, stuff sure. Like, that? like, what do you see with patients that come in here? What are just some things that it's like? I mean, I think EMF, Wi-Fi stuff is a big one. Not grounding is a big one. Getting shitty sleep is a big one. Getting shitty sleep is a major, one. major, major one. Um. You know, and I'm guilty of it too. And and I and I, you know, like I was saying too, like now that I'm living out an hour away from here without traffic, yeah. And only being, you know, like I have I have my kids Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and usually like part of the weekend. So pretty much the only days that I can be out here on the west side to work are Tuesdays and Thursdays. So now like seven days of life jammed into two, less than two. Yeah. So. The legit, some of it's logistical for me. Like, just, you know, go ahead, Chang, grab your ankles and just get ready to enjoy this for two, <laughs> two out of the five days and then spend the rest of the time with your kids. Um, so on those quote unquote off days, when I'm with my kids, it's like, okay, I wake up early, I take them to school. And then like pretty much right after that, I run whatever errands I, I absolutely time crunch have to run. And then I try and just like catch up a little bit on sleep. Um, and you know, cause if I was running in that kind of chronic sleep deficit I, there, I'd be, I'd be six deep already. Yeah. And, you know, all the hair on my head would either be white or be gone yeah. one or the other. Um, but I think shitty sleep is very, very major. Um, and interestingly enough, I, I, I'm surprised how many people struggle with breathing when they sleep. Hmm. You know, whether it's because of a particular position, whether it's because of environment. Sometimes it may be in a, even an issue of like, quote unquote, sleep hygiene. Um, like, you know, my ex would talk about it as like, make sure that the room's totally dark. Make sure that you're in sound like a very quiet environment, blah, 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 blah. To me, I think like, you know, that is neither here nor there because if you're really tired, a lot of those stimuli you can totally tune out. At least for me, I can tune those out. Other people may not. So depending on that particular individual's sensitivities, you need to be able to be moderating the, the sleep environment for the hygiene of it. Yeah. Um, Does that affect the density of the sleep, though? Could you say, like, oh, I slept for eight hours, but I, you know, went to sleep on heroin. That's the only way I can fall asleep is through main lighting or what i mean that's obviously a drastic example. right i i you know I, I can't really comment on that because <laughs> not having had that experience <laughs> i retract the hair with david but you know what i'm saying like i, right. I like i have you know three shots of whiskey before i go to bed and then i smoke some pot and then i don't fall asleep till 2 a.m and then i wake up at 10 a.m i got eight hours 
Is that the same as someone that... I don't think so. I, my, my, I, I can only speak for myself and speak for the people that I've, that I've worked with, but most of the people that I've seen that have gone to sleep thinking like the only way they can go to sleep is buzzed yeah. or whatever. Yeah, it's a problem. They don't really wake up feeling refreshed. They just wake up having slept or lost consciousness for a while. And so sometimes that, you know, that becomes a survival mechanism. Like you're just so overstimmed. You're just so burdened by something going on up here in, in the mind or in the heart that the only way you can disengage is to self-medicate, quote unquote medicate. I say that with heavy quotes around that. <clears throat> Such that you are numbed out enough to disconnect and lose consciousness and that's your way of quote-unquote sleeping um i don't think that's ideal because like at least for me like those times that i've gone to sleep drunk or buzzed i've woken up the next morning just feeling like i got punched in the face yeah. and it wasn't that i got punched in the face it's just that like my whole body was tight um similarly there are some people that like they'll 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 go to sleep after, you know, whether their their drug of choice is food, or something else. Like if you, most of the time when I when I've talked to people who go to sleep too full, their sleep's not deep either because then it's a very dream disturbed sleep. Yeah. Um, so being able to just totally let your spirit kind of settle into your body and just tune out, like. You know, letting things run in the background, you know, it, letting your brain process stuff in the background, but letting it not be so vivid that it just like you wake up feeling like you just ran a marathon while getting, you know, your ass kicked. That kind of sleep, that kind of restorative sleep, that kind of immune system effective sleep is something that we all, I think, as a society, as modern society, and certainly in this country, in the U.S., we need to pay more attention to. Mm hmm. Yeah, the, that's, I think that's really a powerful point, the idea of, of allowing your, your spirit, which a lot of people could have different definitions of what that is, to, to, to be able to rest. And I think that that's a lot of people in society, they don't have any of that you know, tranquil balance, equanimity, any of that. They're in this, this constant state of static. And the only way in order to turn off is to is to really disassociate, and we end up disassociating throughout the day as well. That's I think it's like social media and like you know, whatever addictions that you might have throughout the day. It's just this ongoing process of the moment that you feel like maybe just being present with yourself that feels uncomfortable. So then you reach out for something else. Right. Um, you know, there's <clears throat> like one way I look at it, and one way I talk about it is that we we as a society in the States at least look for more and more and more and more stim, whether that stimulation is information, whether that stimulation is food, sights and sounds, whether that sim stimulation is chemical in terms of drugs, like caffeine or whatever, what have you, right? Whether that stimulation is in terms of like, you know, the adrenaline junkie moments, hmm. we're always looking for more, bigger, better, faster, like more vibrant. Yeah. But sometimes, we need to be able to disassociate. We need to be able to, to turn the volume down in the other direction. We need to be able to soften. We need to be able to relax. We need to be able to slow down. And I'm not saying that you need to do only that, but like if you, one of the things I talk about commonly is the, is the definition of the word taiji. You know, taiji literally means polar opposites, going to extremes. So going to extremes of yin and yang, means that you should be able to go like hard, fast, balls out, intense. And you should also be able to go to the opposite. Mm -hmm. If you're really good at one, but you suck at the other, you need to, you need, really need to investigate that. And I think most of us only pay lip service to relaxation. Totally. We don't know. Most of, I mean, the average person, even in the fitness world, doesn't know shit about relaxation. It's that they literally don't know. They don't know. You think because you're like, yeah, like I do my rest thing. I do my 10 minute meditation thing. But the, the difference between that and I don't know yet, but I've, I've had sprinkles of it where I did recently, I did like a, it was like, it was like a 50 minutes. It wasn't even an hour, but no movement. And I kind of cheated and moved a little bit. But during that time frame, I went deeper in a, my meditation than I ever had in my life because mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm always moving, 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 moving. Mm -hmm. 
and we end up moving ourselves or myself in this case out of that presence with yourself. I don't think hardly anybody walking around has ever really been present with themselves. Yeah, I don't know that I'd have the courage to quite say that, but I, <laughs> yeah, I think it might be, I think that, it might be a bit far. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that that for the majority of people in in modern America right now, we could do, or modern, I should say modern America, modern world, we could do better. <laughs> we should do better. Um, you know, but simply like our muscles, right? We're we're so focused on oh, get muscle size, get muscle definition, get muscle tone. Have you practiced muscle relaxation? Have you practiced the ability to just disengage that tension? Have you practiced anything like that so that your muscle can actually flush out some of that congestion and recover faster? Have you practiced being able to challenge your muscle to relax under pressure? You know, like all of these things are, are questions that I think we need to consider a little bit more deeply. Yeah. Have you done any extended sets? No movement? Um... I know that I've done one or two. I just can't remember when the last time was. I'm sure it was like probably well before I had kids. Yeah. I'm becoming really fascinated with it right now. And just seeing the little bits of that. Like I've been, so I'm, I'm regularly doing 40 minute sets mm -hmm. and uh, trying not to move. And I'm still cheating a little bit. I'm, I'm a bitch. Like I'm trying to figure it out. If, but it's the most challenging thing I've ever endured. You know, swinging kettlebells and picking people up and sprinting and, you know, all that stuff. Surfing. It's, it's like, it's like no, that's like child's play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just being able to sit with yourself and have no movement when you get the nose itch and the back pain and the knee thing. And just like, oh, I'm just going to witness it, breathe into it, and then move on. But people do this for, have you heard of the marathon monks before? Uh, you know, I've heard about it, but not something that I've really investigated. Go there. So just, just people can just look it up. But they do. It's like an ongoing process. Um, long story short, they eventually get to a point where they sit. It's either nine days or seven and a half days with no food, no water, and very little motion. One, wow. One, one time a day, I think they do this like ceremonial. They go and gather water or do something. I, I don't remember what the thing is, but just look it up. You know, but there's people out there that are doing this to a really high degree. You know, and another component that they add to it is also running. They start off running 30 kilometers a day for 100 days straight. Then eventually that leads into, I think, 50 kilometers a day. And it's, a, I believe, a seven-year journey. And in that process, if you end up quitting the journey, mm -hmm. in the first 100 days, you can, you, can, you can opt out. It's fine. After that, from that point forward, you carry around this little rope and a knife. And if you opt out of it, then you choose to kill yourself. Hmm. Pretty fascinating. But so I, I was listening to this thing about it today. And he was said to the guy I was talking about, he's like, yeah, people are just a bunch of bitches. <laughs> like, like we think all that we're doing, but we're just, we're just stuck at the superficial layer of ourselves. Very few people are, have, are, have the cojones to, to just sit with yourself. Like I would love to challenge people, like sit with yourself, no movement for an hour. Just see what pops up out of it. You know, it's funny that you said that because that's also it's also a great allegory for, let's say, something like foam rolling. Yeah. You know, like a lot of people think foam rolling is about beating the shit out of your muscles. It's really not. The foam roller is just a just a, a device to give you a stimulus. <coughs> so like if you're foam rolling a particular muscle, let's say your quads, like your vastus lateralis or your rectus femoris, like one of the muscles along the front of your thigh. If you watch the average person foam roll in the gym, they treat it like it's a speed sport because they want to get to the real workout. Yeah. Well, what if when you foam rolled, you actually use that device as a way of introducing pressure to a muscle to check how relaxed you can really be and how relaxed you really are? Because a lot of the people that go, yeah, yeah, I foam roll, I didn't feel a thing. You know, when you have those same people slow down and actually challenge them to really relax themselves down in the roller, the same spots that they said were absolutely problem-free suddenly become very, very sensitive. And it's like, well, you know, hmm. to me, a healthy soft tissue should be able to accept some pressure, right? And if it's like 
just the weight of your leg on a roller is causing you to start breaking out in sweat, maybe that might be a sign for you to start reevaluating how much tension you're carrying around in that muscle that you don't need to be. Yeah. So similarly, like if our nervous systems are amped up like that in terms of our attention and in terms of our movement, think about how much is going on in the deeper layers of our muscles as well, close to our joints. Is it that we're necessarily like in some sort of toxic environment where everything's giving us joint inflammation? There, I believe that there's some of that going on. However, I believe that if you look at the, the way the muscles are, the deepest parts of the muscle, the, mu the parts of the muscle that are, that are the deeper layers closest to the bone, those are the fibers that we most often don't get to. Hmm. Yeah. And so like if we're doing stuff like foam rolling, why not challenge those deeper fibers to really relax? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So how do people get into – so fancy unnecessary words like interosseous membrane is the space in between in your arm would be the radius and the ulna and the, and the leg. It would be the, the tib and the fib. There's connective tissue. The kind of it's like a suspension system mm -hmm. for those bones. But it's something that's like, what the hell is that? Uh, how do people start communicating at a deeper level with their musculoskeletal nerve vascular system i think the first stage and probably the most important stage that most people overlook is just simply to ask themselves hey can i relax more <laughs> and the moment they start getting defensive about that shit and going no no i'm totally relaxed like did you test to see if you could relax more did you try and see if you could relax more did you search for tension and then try and consciously release it and if you're too quick to say yes you probably haven't, you probably done, it. haven't done it. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. You know, like the people that are most defensive about some shit are usually the people that they really need to deal with that. Yeah. You yeah. know? Oh, yeah. So, you know, we pay lip service. We, especially uh, when I say we, I think we as athletes and, you know, kind of in the demographic that you and I roll in, yeah. we pay a lot of lip service to recovery. But I think there's so much more that we need to investigate about recovery. Yeah. Yeah. It's what's your self care practice look like? What's like daily, <laughs> daily? Um, try to get in whenever it's <clears throat> conceivably possible. Yeah, it's really opportunistic. To yeah. be honest with you, like I think recovery, especially for people that are driven, and I, I don't know if ambitious is the right word, but like, you know, I, I have a passion for doing the stuff that I do. You know, like it motivates me. Like even if I wasn't making any money. Like, I would still love to do the stuff that I do. Like, I love working with patients. I love working with clients. I love working with the ca caliber of athletes that I'm working with. You know, I love being able to, to study and train with the kind of, le like, legendary martial artists that I, that I get access to on a regular basis. So much so that all of that stuff, like, I think if I were, if I were made of money, I would... I would gladly pay to do it. And even if I, you know, even if I wasn't made of money, like, and I'm at the stage where I'm, I'm at now, like there's so much stuff that I'm lucky enough to get paid for that. I love this stuff enough to pay for it. Yeah. Even now. Um, but I, I think the recovery aspect of it is like, okay, because I've got all these opportunities that are some, many of which are time sensitive. And I need to capitalize on them or I need to benefit from them in a or learn from them in a certain time frame. My cut recovery is not optimal because it like, like I said, like, you know, waking up at 345 in the morning or 330 in the morning to, to jump in the shower to, you know, to pack my clothes to, you know, move the weapons into the car to, you know, get, make sure I got food in the car, blah, 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 blah. And then to drive out to start my first client or first patient at 6 a.m. out here on this side of town. It's not ideal. Hmm. But my rec for, as far as recovery goes, it's like those, those evenings um, that I don't have to drive out here, you know, I make sure that I'm turning in early. I'm, you know, those mornings I don't have to drive out here whenever I can. You know, I, I, I make sure that, like, I am dead asleep, out cold, until like that alarm goes off. So very rarely am I going to like, you know, do shit like stay out late drinking. Yeah. Dude, it's, it's almost never it's, worth it's, it. It's, ne it's never worth it. It's, if I, mean, I go out drinking with you, it's because I like really, really like you. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's a huge sacrifice. If I'm out past like 
eleven thirty at mm-hmm. night, and like as soon as I get into that realm, because I know the whole next day, I'm going to be in a deficit. Yep. That's that becomes the normal for most people, I think, where it's just like, oh, I'm just so accustomed to deficit. Like if I feel any remnant of decent, that's like a really good day. Dude, is it <laughs> is it dad of two? Yeah. You know, like uh, if I stay out past. <laughs> You know, uh, even on those nights when, when you know, their mom has custody of the kids. If I stay out past eight, wow. You know? <laughs> yeah. So Tuesdays and Thursday nights when I'm here on this side of town and I go to the Inasano Academy, like, especially if I'm doing the evening classes, like Kali, which is usually from like eight to nine or eight to nine thirty. That's like <laughs> a wild night. Yeah. What kind of martial arts are you practicing right now? Um, I'm, my current focus right now is, uh, on the Inasano blend, mostly, uh, Southeast Asian martial arts, Kali, Silat, um, and then Shui Jiao, Chinese wrestling. Mm. What's that look like? Chinese wrestling, going back to what we were talking about as far as like, uh, acro yoga. Yeah. You know, like, I think most wrestling in general is about really being able to take another human being's body and then command it through space or in space. And trying to find the most efficient and sustainable way of doing that. Um, and so, Sui Jiao is great because, like, from a martial art perspective, it, it you know, when you asked if I'd done any stuff like hand balancing or, or you know, acro yoga or partner yoga like that. And I couldn't say, yeah, but, like, on in one sense, the closest thing that I have to that is working on throws with a partner. Totally. It's the same. Yeah. Not so, the same, but it's it's the same with a lot more dynamic momentum. But at right. one point, it's the same. Finding that stack, that's how you throw the shit out of somebody. Yes. If you can't stack at some point, you're never going to get the leverage. Right. Right. And actually, I think working a lot of the stuff that you're doing with the stack, like really being able to find the stack and capitalize on the stack and then and then work just a hair in and a hair out, like just being able to flirt with not totally bailing on it but also like, okay, I found that point of efficiency. Let me explore what happens when I shift a little bit here or there or do whatever else, right? And then allowing yourself to figure out how to recover that. I think that's where you develop insane amounts of strength. Yeah. It's a, I think of it as like, a, like an electrical cord. Mm-hmm. Is when you see somebody like a, like a Bruce Lee, for example, mm-hmm. he's so fine-tuned with the technicality of his movement that he doesn't need to get very big. But then you look at, say, like, like go down to Mecca, you know, Gold's Gym in Venice. Mm-hmm. You have a bunch of terrible, terrible movers. Really good with A to B movements, mm-hmm. you know? So a lot of, like, hypertrophy changes getting big. Mm-hmm. But as far as finding that connection point, they've had to actually almost, like, increase the insulation around the wire because it's a, not a finely tuned wire. So in order for that signal to, to pass through, the wire has to be really thick. Mm. So you end up getting really thick. Mm. But when you really fine tune that signal, all of a sudden you can do a lot more with a lot less effort. And then all of a sudden these big bulky muscles don't manifest because you just, you didn't need to build up the insulation. Mm. Does that make sense? Or does that sound like some crazy, I don't think I actually, as I was listening well. to that, I was like that, uh, like I want to replay that in my head and chew on that a little bit more because like, it, it's interesting. I think a lot of the guys that are down in Mecca at Gold's, when you've got guys that are bodybuilders, they're looking for a particular cosmetic goal. Yeah. I shouldn't say they move like they, they move perfectly for what they're looking for. Right. But if they wanted to wrestle or they wanted to skip down some rocks or something like that that are slippery, all of a sudden all that muscle becomes a liability. A liability. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, that's that's probably more along the lines of how I'd say it. Yeah. Yeah. I apologize to anybody that's listening. <laughs> 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 from that yeah what's um so what do you gather from something like chinese wrestling like what's like the the foundations of that i don't really know anything about it chinese wrestling's cool um at least the particular branch that i practice i i quite enjoy um because unlike uh let's say judo where the grappling or the the training starts when you you're holding on to the other person's uniform or their gi right with chinese wrestling it in in at least the balding style of it 
it doesn't matter if the person is trying to grab you. It doesn't matter if the person is trying to tackle you. Either using the uniform or b regular body handles holding onto the limbs or if they're punching or kicking, you need to be able to handle whatever attack or whatever movement is coming at you and then create a throw or a takedown. And so that to me has been, uh, it's been a lot of fun because, you know, it's one thing if you've got another guy that's just grabbing you. It's a whole nother thing if the guy is grabbing you and trying to hit you mm. or trying to kick you and then trying to throw. Um, and, you know, like I said, at least from a tactical standpoint, um, I'm quite in love with Sui Jiao. And, uh, you know, when you can hit someone with your limb, it's one sensation of control. If you let the ground hit them, it's a totally different situ it's a totally different sensation of control. Mm. What does that mean? Let the ground hit them. So if you if you throw another individual, right? They're at the point of impact when their body hits the ground, that ground doesn't move. You know, like especially if you're doing it on a non padded surface. Yeah. So now that's a massive point of impact. Whereas it's like if you take your own hand or your own foot and hit them, there's a smaller surface area that's making contact. So sure you can impart a lot of force and a lot of damage, but it, there's a different kind of efficiency. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like if you were to punch me and I, and I don't drop right away, now you have to chase after me to continue to punch me because like, let's say you hit me and I, and I move back, then you've got to do different things to maintain that kind of effective range. Whereas if you pick me up and slam me on the ground and I'm right there in front of you, like you, you have a positional advantage. The ground has already hit me, probably knocked the wind out of me. I'm like, Slightly, you know, probably a little bit loopy, dazed from the from the throw, so like mild concussion, and or whatever joint damage I've sustained or soft tissue I've da I've damage I've sustained from by virtue of the fall. So in terms of the in terms of the take in terms of like um, combat strategy, I you know I, I've always been in love with throws for that reason. What do you think of the 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 crazy videos where there's guys like building up chi in their hands and then they like mortal combat it into other people and they send them flying across the room. Is that all complete bullshit? Is there some reality to that? Um, I don't know because <laughs> I, you know, honestly I can't say, um, uh, because until I meet those guys, yeah. until I feel what they're doing, I can't say, but, you know, there've been guys that, that, um, okay, let's take Sistema for example. Um, Sistema is one of those martial arts that takes a lot of flack in the media, especially like if you look at it on, on social media, people that have never experienced it will see a Sistema demo and they'll think it's full of shit. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. They're certainly like, you know, any restaurant, like you, let's talk, let's say, I don't know, Italian food. There's some Italian food restaurants. It's like, you couldn't pay me to go in there and eat. There are other Italian food restaurants that are like superb. You know, you couldn't pay to get in there and eat. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Martial arts schools are kind of, in, in a lot of ways, the same way. There are some that, like, they may advertise something, but the skill level of the instructor is not all that impressive. And then there are others that are, like, the skill level of the instructor is just off the charts. Yeah. So, you know, I've been fortunate, um, you know, working with Martin Wheeler, who is my instructor in Sistema, like... This guy's, you know, was a badass long before he ever came to that particular style of training. Um, highly skilled in Kenpo and boxing and judo. So, I mean, and, and a well, you know, well-known bouncer. Um, when he got to start training in Sistema, which was like one of the pinnacles of soft martial art training, um, he just felt like, wow, I, what have I been doing wrong all these years? Mm. Um, and then, you know, for me, same thing. Like when I when I started training... Sistema with him, it was like, it made a lot of the Taiji principles that my dad told me about when I was a kid suddenly click in a way that's very salient. Like, oh, he just decked me across the room. Or, you know, he like, when you feel a guy hit you and it doesn't look like he wound up to hit you. Hmm. And it ends up hurting so badly that it feels like someone's pulling your fingers and toes out of your solar plexus. It's a wake-up call. You know, like, there have been times when Martin has barely tapped me. Like, it just, uh, like, if you look at, if you were to look at it, you're like, how did that hurt you, man? Like, you must be really weak. And, like, 
no, nah, man, dude, that shit hurt. Trust me. Like, I wouldn't make that up. And then, like, three or four days later, the bruise starts showing up in those parts right where he hit. Then you're like, mm-hmm, there's something to that. Mm. That's the cable analogy that I was, like, pitifully trying to describe. You know, that's the, the tighter the hose, the more concentrated that energy ends up being. Whereas oftentimes we have these big, huge, muscle-bound hoses, but there's not that sharp, able to that that drive that the capacity to be able to really drive that into a a, a small space and that's hand balancing or that's you know finding leverage to throw somebody as long as you're outside of that that midline as we called it then it's the hose needs to be really big and fat right but if you can find that that's that concentration of energy in quotations do you know what i'm saying i'm yeah i i I, I do poorly It, it makes sense from a from a mechanical standpoint the interesting thing is if you look at like truly soft arts, it's more than just physics because you're actually trying to relax into someone else. It's very mm. weird. Like mm. instead of trying to like, okay, I'm going to align everything and then make the tension just right so that I can punch through this particular vital point, pressure point, whatever, right? What if I just relaxed my body so much that like I just let the weight of my limb fall through you? Hmm. You know, it's a it's a very different thing. It's a very different ball of wax. But to get to that point of relaxation, does one need to first find that alignment, and that's where the the relaxation comes from, or is there some other game that's happening? That I, I think at the higher levels, you can you can find that kind of relaxation even without like what's commonly thought of as an acceptable alignment. Like if you look at some of the postures and some of the positions that that some uh, like a practitioner of let's say Martin Wheeler's level can hit you from, it almost doesn't make sense how he's able to generate so much power, especially in the absence of raw speed. You know, like, you know, it looked like a guy was off balance. He's falling away from me, and he didn't hit me that fast. How come he was able to generate that much power and and make me feel that much pain? Hmm. How do you explain it? I'm not sure yet. Shit. <laughs> I'm not sure. Do you think that maybe that could be flirting with some some of like the the like the previous question of of some type of metaphysical something? Yeah. What the hell is chi? How can we describe that in a, in a tangible way? And by we, I mean you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the chi describer. <laughs> you know, I th- I think of chi as really just energy, um, and. You know, energy is such a such a foreign concept to most of us anyway that I think that that to look at it as bioelectric, okay, maybe that's part of it, but you know, there's so much more than that. Like when chemicals react, do they give off some sort of? Do they potentially give off some sort of electrical current? Yes. So I think there's something to that there. How we are able to guide that with our minds, how the interplay of chemicals are in our body based on what we're thinking, based on what we're trying to achieve at that moment in time. I'm not that clear on. So for me to, for me to posit a theory, you know, it's, it's like just slinging random crap at the wall and seeing what sticks. Yeah. So something like an acupuncture is that, and, and working with meridians and these channels throughout the body, is that finding points of stagnation or like a bottleneck essentially and using the acupuncture as a means of stimulating that according channel to some, open? According to some theories, yes. Um, you know, according to other theories, it's like um, I'm introducing a needle to the le- a particular layer of tissue where there's going to, I'm going to create a particular sort of biochemical response by stimulating a nerve ending or what have you, right? So uh, there, uh, the explanations are many. Yeah. Um, but really, I think the proof is in the pudding because you can see people that get acupuncture and some of them, you know, don't see a tangible benefit and some of them do. Why? Right. You know? How much of that do you think might be um, placebo, which placebo is, is obviously a humongous word that, you know, some people think of it as being silly, but it's obviously it's like it's activating your body's internal healing mechanisms is not something to poo poo on. But uh, do you think that there's some type of like psychosomatic component to that? Or like I believe in acupuncture? Or is there more of a, a physical bridge there as opposed to 
a psycho bridge versus whether it's working or not. I, I think that I think that's contextual. Right. It really depends on the patient and it really depends on the practitioner. Like if the practitioner is super skilled, you know, r- to produce reliable results. Yeah. And, you know, the assessment of the patient's correct, then you should be able to have a certain I, I feel at least in, in my mind and in my experience, I feel like you should have a certain level of efficacy. Hmm. How often do organs play a role in what's happening in your muscles and your sleeping patterns and your emotional patterns and all, all the time mm. all the time How do i mean more often i don't always see at least for myself i don't always see organ involvement in terms of like musculoskeletal pain and stuff like that i don't always see that and i think by the time like you're seeing an organ system di- manifest in terms of musculoskeletal pain you're in deep shit <laughs> um but as far as, you know, quality of sleep, as far as recovery, as far as all those things, yeah, I think it's absolutely crucial. Uh, like, okay, let's take the digestive system, for example, right? Let's say you, for for whatever reason you're, eat, you're eating stuff that you like to eat, but for whatever reason you don't digest efficiently. Well, that stuff that's not digesting efficiency is now fermenting in your gut. And as it's fermenting, it's generating gas. So, like, you roll over in your sleep, and then that gas bubble is making your stomach uncomfortable. And so that impairs the depth of your sleep. That impairs your quality of sleep. Mm. You know, it's like if you're having to wake up every 15 minutes because you're blowing this, like, comforter floating fart, <laughs> then, like, that's I think that's an indicator of, like, your digestive system, right? Like, you're not as healthy as you think you are. You may be able to lift a truck worth of weight, but, like, if you can't sleep through the night, because like your guts are so lit up. Yeah. You know, maybe that maybe that's worth deeper, you know, investigation. What about waking up multiple times throughout the night to piss? Is that something that you've that you've come up with any types of ideas or been working with people with? Um I think for some individuals there's a there's a tendency to to hyperhydrate a little bit too late at night. Sure. And that I don't I mean that's obviously in my mind going to lead you to like having to wake up several times a night to use the restroom to take a leak. Yeah. Um, for people that aren't doing that, I think the other issue that comes to my mind is it's like, maybe there's a lack of tone in the bladder, Mm. you know, so you're not emptying as much as you could, or then the other things that that come to mind are stuff like diabetes. Hmm. How about squats and the value of squat as far as like speaking of tonus of you know, the bladder, but just tonus of, of your, your visceral system and your body as a whole, as you're going through that deep squat, it's, you know, you could kind of think of your respiratory diaphragm as being like a sponge of sorts. Mm-hmm. You know, every time you're, you're breathing through, you're kind of pulling that sponge up, pulling it down your pelvic floor as well as a similar, Oh, by sponge, I mean a uh, plunger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but sp- it's a spongy plunger. Okay. <laughs> you know, but it's similar. I follow you. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I follow you. <laughs> I meant plunger, though. But taking your pelvic floor through at full range of motion through a squat, taking your respiratory diaphragm through, you know, through breath, but also I think squatting has an impact as, as well. Is that something that you're incorporating into your thought with working with patients at all? Just like what's your, what's your functional range of motion of, of just say specifically a squat? Or is that something that's... You're not not pondering on no no. I mean the deep squat is is part and parcel of both the selective functional movement assessment, the SFMA, and the FMS Mm. functional movement screen. Yeah. So it's something I use on intake as well as discharge. You know, like when I when I meet a new when I see a new patient and especially when they come to me for like you know some sort of sports or musculoskeletal related thing, it's like okay, let's assess you, let's put you through the SFMA, and then one of the seven tests of the SFMA is a deep squat. So how well the body's able to move into and out of that position is crucial yeah. information, I think, for any clinician. Yeah. Um, is the deep squat beneficial? It depends on for whom. What I mean by that is this. Should we all have access to that? Ideally, yes. But if you're, let's say, I don't know, I'm just pulling numbers out of a hat, but let, let's say you're just like a 63-year-old guy that's been pretty sedentary most of his adult life after college and or after having kids and then like your version of exercise is you know walking around maybe playing nine holes of golf yeah 
would it be ideal if you could deep squat? Yeah, absolutely. It would be. But the reality of the situation is that you probably haven't been through those ranges of motion in decades. So to have that person deep squat when they're, they're just having a hard time being able to hinge, you know, with a neutral spine, uh, you know, let's give them an easier breaking point. Yeah. Does that make sense? Totally. So, like, if the if the goal is for them, let's say, to, to, I don't know, break a brick, well, let's just make sure that they can actually move their hand through the range of motion first or move their body through the range of motion without any resistance, without any impact first. Yeah. You know, let's make sure that's that's accessible. Yeah. We'll wrap up here in a jiffy. Um, is there any type of, like, protocol that you take with people? Like, something that I'll play with with people is once they're – but starts to tuck under. Mm-hmm. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. I think that you know, if if you go in a deep, if you go anywhere around the world, people doing a deep squat, sitting down, like they'll have a bit of the butt wink thing mm-hmm. happening. Um, but sometimes with people, I'll say like, in t- once that hinge breaks down, just stop and and flirt with that range of motion. Well, very Whatever. wise. That's yeah. yeah. I do that same thing. Okay. Is there anything else for people listening that uh, as far as like coaching themselves or maybe people that coach other people, just like how do we get people from no squat potential to a healthy squat, being able to poop in the woods, essentially, that's the end goal. Right. Um, (laughs) Being Mr. Four Star Camping myself, I would say like don't poop in the woods for one. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But uh, yeah, I think for most of us, especially those of us that are in fitness, we get so enamored of like, you should be able to do this. You should be able to do that. Yeah. Why don't we just make better, better? In other words, like if they come in completely unable to sit down in a chair and control themselves, slow motion from the chair up to standing and back down with ease and without looking like they're passing a kidney stone. Why don't we make that the first step? Hmm. You know, why don't we make activities of daily life rather than like rather than ranges of motion that they've never had to access or haven't had to access since they were three, instead of pushing them to that kind of high threshold or high risk or high threat kind of situation, why don't we just work on giving them a better mastery, a bet a much more comfortable mastery of the stuff that they already do in in quote unquote real life? And so once they build competence in those movement patterns, then they will be more confident to try other stuff. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, we'll talk about it after, but that's the online program that I'm going to be doing in the next couple months. Mm -hmm. That's the premise of the whole entire thing. So that's, that's it. It's every moment, a hundred percent of the time you are practicing your body, Mm -hmm. you know? So as we're sitting here, there's options to kind of put ourselves into something that's more of a compromised position that you're practicing breakdown, Mm -hmm. or you can put yourself in a position that's kind of practicing stack. (laughs) <laughs> and I think that's important to realize because like a lot of people will be very militant. Like you should be sitting at this particular right. situation, like all the fucking time. You gotta, really? You got to dance too. Like you've got to be able to explore the negative. You know, like if I want to be able to sit back and lean on my counter like this, who's to say I can't? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? But if I want my forward head, if I want my head to be able to crane forward a little bit to make a point with a particular kind of posture, I should be able to. However, I don't want to be locked into this so that I can still sit back up here with ease relaxation without looking like someone just tased me from the back (laughs) right so like there's that you know we get so enamored it's funny actually you mentioned this i think before we started recording but we get so enamored of these theories and dogmas like we make shit up and then that that theory becomes a dogma that dogma becomes something that people fight over you know one of the most well-known cancer researchers breast cancer researchers is um uh someone that I've had the opportunity to spend some time with. And she said the same thing. She said, you know, in re- really in terms of modern medicine, we get all of these theories based on some anecdotal evidence. And then over time, we don't realize how much we don't know. But really, like, we think that this is a law of medicine. This is this. This is that. But in reality, and these are her words, we don't know shit. Right. And to hear that from that level of re- researcher was like, wow, that gives me a whole new faith in medicine. Because then it like now if the top minds are that humble, then maybe the ones that are lower down on the totem pole can take a cue from that. Yeah. 
that's kind of what I meant when I was saying most people, and by most people, I, I, I just mean myself, but um, haven't ever actually experienced presence with themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's it's like, it's, it's like we just don't know shit. <laughs> In, introspection is, dude, like, you know, as far as knowing oneself, introspection is a bitch because a lot for a lot of people for a lot of people because like we've gotten so used to, to like hiding our negatives or covering up our negatives or compensating for our negatives that we never address them yeah and we get so uncomfortable about dress, addressing them that we never grow so if we can't address them we certainly can't talk about them which i think is is why like psychotherapy is so valuable for so many people mm-hmm. to be forced to like hey these are issues that you're presenting with. Let's get to the root of that. And I and I think way too many people are afraid to look at it. Right. Afraid to admit. So these are I think these are very useful. These are very useful concepts and, and conversations to be having. Yeah. There's uh Galileo I'm pretty sure Galileo. He was put in at the end of his life he was put into house arrest and he was you know, considered crazy and they stopped any publishing of any of his work because it wasn't the heliocentric model of the, mm-hmm. the world. So the earth's in the center of everything. Mm-hmm. And so culturally we're so married to this idea because if we disprove it, that means that everything that we stand for is wrong. And so sometimes we do that with ev- fucking anything, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, where it's like it, it's too painful to maybe think outside of my current dogma. Mm-hmm. So fuck it, I'll just stay here. You know, and it's like how many people just kind of stay within that confines and then they die. Sure, and then we <laughs> demonize everything else. <laughs> you know, everything everything that's divergent from those theories, everything that's divergent from our comfortable dogma must be wrong, must be evil, must be dark, must yeah. be, you know, like maybe it's totally right. And maybe what we take as gospel truth is only true within a particular context. Yeah. All right. Thanks, man. Good shit. <laughs> really appreciate it. Feel the stack? Yep. It's <laughs> solid. <laughs> All right. Recording over. Thank you so much.